Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host over here on the side, uh, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, webcast, online show. Um, nobody can figure out and decide, come to an agreement on what you call these things. But whatever we want to call us, we're live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, we do record the show every week, though, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website and um, check our archives in there and watch the show at your convenience. Um, we have all of our shows listed there. Um, we post the recordings up to YouTube for easy access for watching. Any slides or documents people have are included as well, and if any websites are mentioned, they get added into our delicious account collected all together for you for reference. This one, Sally's got one today that we can put in there, yeah. <laughs> So we'll have something up for that. Um, both the show and the recordings are all free and open to anyone to watch. So please do um, share with your friends, colleagues, neighbors, family, whoever might be interested in any of our topics. Send them to our site and have them take a look at our upcoming shows or our um, recordings. We are um, pretty broad in what we do here. Um, basically, our only criteria is something is library related or useful to libraries, things libraries are doing, um, new pro projects or programs are involved in, things that might be of interest to libraries, so sometimes a little out of the box thinking sometimes, you'll see, but somehow everything is, is library related. Um, and we do all sorts of things, presentations, book reviews, training sessions, mini training sessions, we're only here for an hour, <laughs> nothing too in depth, but um, basically anything. Um, we do have guest speakers that come in sometimes to talk on the show, but we also have Nebraska Library Commission staff, and that's what we have this morning. Um, a group of us here, and I think we'll just, as we each talk first, we'll introduce ourselves briefly. It might get easier to do that. Um, so all of us here at the table are all Library Commission staff in all various departments actually here. And um, what we're going to talk about today is uh, this new... Well, something new-ish that we've been doing. Um, I had to go back and figure out um, about two years ago this month, um, we started doing a regular blog series called Friday Reads. Um, and you may have heard of that. It's not something that we invented necessarily. Um, it's been something that's been going on on Twitter. Basically, every Friday, people would use the hashtag, hashtag Friday Reads, and just share what book they're reading. Um, so people can see what's out there, what people are interested in. Um, and then it's kind of, um, people have expanded on that sometimes in doing more blog posts about what they've been reading on their own blogs or websites or whatever. And I think it was Laura's idea, mm -hmm. if I remember. Yeah, Laura Johnson, who was um, previously our um, continuing education coordinator, came up with this idea two years ago to have commission, library commission, Nebraska Library Commission staff do the same kind of thing. Um, and she recruited a group of people every Friday taking turns writing up a little, um, just something about a book they liked, a book they're currently reading, whatever it would, um, whatever they wanted to. Um, and it's expanded. There's more people, more of us doing it now. Every now and then, every time a new staff person comes on, they get nudged. <laughs> Um, I would this. say invited. Invited, yes. okay. <laughs> invited, yes. Hey, and then this is that. something fun. You, can, you want to do this? Um, and Laura did retire back in December, and um, Amy Owen, who's um, new-ish to the commission, too. How long has she been with us now? Uh, two, two, no, two or three years. Two or three years, yeah. yeah. Um, she has taken um, on the responsibility of monitoring this and making sure people have something, or people are scheduled every Friday to do it. So Amy's in charge, and um, we decided to share a little bit about some of this. So Amy helped gather some people. She's not here with us today. She's home with us. A sick kid, a sick child. But hi, hi Amy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, things are going well. Um, <laughs> So uh, we do have a whole, we've discovered in doing this, and I discovered this when I was looking back to see what kinds of books. We got 40 to 50 people working here at the commission. I guess I'm not exactly sure. So many different ta um, varying tastes and, and people in different um, have different um, things they read. Um, if you go to our blog, you can just search on the phrase Friday Reads and you'll find the, all of them with all of them together. They will come up so you can go and see all of them that have been out there. But we're each going to share just two of the ones that we've blogged about over um, the uh, history of this program. So I'm going to start. I'm first. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, this is not in any particular order. It's just alphabetically by our first names. So, <laughs> you tell us what your um, when you introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. um, tell us what your uh, job title is. Oh, well, oh yeah, I don't actually do that when I usually do no, the show. Yeah. So, um, at the Library Commission, I am the um, 
Library Development Consultant is my title, which is really broad um, and doesn't tell you too much in detail about what I do, but that's okay. It just I do a bunch of different things here. Um, I'm in the library development department, and I run Encompass Live. I help people with their E-rate, um, which is where we got a deadline coming up this week. Um, <laughs> any any public libraries who are applying for E-rate funding, um, I'm getting involved with helping Richard Miller, who's our director, doing um, strategic planning. Um, some helping that's going to be helping libraries with that, and technology planning, um, just a whole bunch of things. So. Um, my first book that I have here, what I decided to do is the very first one I did on Friday Reads and then my most recent one. That was just an easy way for me to pick. Um, the first one that I talked about was Fables, um, which is by Bill Willingham, and Fables is actually a graphic novel. Um, well, it's a graphic novel type thing now. It's a comic book series um, that he started, Bill um, Willingham did, and I'm not exactly even sure how long ago, 2000 something. Um, and it's uh, unfortunately has wrapped up the series. So you know, comic books that come out weekly or every other week. Um, if you're a comic collector like I am, you know that. But <laughs> if you're not, they come up pretty regularly. And he did just wrap it up last year, unfortunately. Oh, I did. I did write. 2002 is when um, he started it. What it is is um, fables is characters from fairy, fairy tales, folklore, mythology. Um, it's all stories about them, but in modern times, not in their fairy tale times when they are. They have been actually ousted from their homelands. They lived in fairy tale land um, by some mysterious force that at the beginning you don't know who that is, and I still haven't gotten to the part where they actually have more explained what happened. But they live in New York City. They're hiding out in New York City. Um, uh, they are um, uh, I don't know, immortal, might be the word. So some of them are hundreds of years old. But they've been hiding out in New York City in this um, specific uh, apartment building that's just for them. And they have uh, you know certain protections that no one knows that they're actually fairy tale characters. They're just they look. You think they're just like anybody. Um, nobody is really. Um, uh, you know, stands out, but they stick together in this community called Fable, um, called Fable Town. Um, they live in this apartment building called the Woodland Luxury Apartments, and this just tells the stories about what they're doing here. Um, it's a really cool series um, of books. They're very different from what you might remember. They're not just the fairy tale characters in New York City. They are beyond the times of the stories we've read. So if you know um, what Snow White's story is, she got married to Prince Charming happily ever after. Well. Centuries later, no, they're divorced. <laughs> um, things didn't work out. Um, she's the deputy mayor of Fable Town. Um, the sheriff is um, Big B Wolf, aka the Big Bad Wolf, from <laughs> Thrill of Pigs. Yep. Um, he's the sheriff, but he's a shapeshifter. As he's a wolf, he's like a werewolf. Is how that works out. So he can live in New York City as his human self. Um, any characters that are like animals, um, like the Three Little Pigs, for example, they are in the series, or monsters or giants or anything, they can't live in New York City. They live in a place called The Farm in upstate New York. Um, I'm from upstate New York. I've never seen it, so who knows? I don't know where exactly it is. <laughs> um, but it's a really cool stories, series of books. I like fairy tales and mythology, so I got into reading it. Um, they've all been collected into, you know, it's a series of comic books that have been collected into books and more like graphic novel style. So you can read like six or eight of them at a time from one book. Um, he did wrap up the series in the into in 2015, though, so there are not any new ones for it. Um, but it's just a really interesting, different take on what could happen after the fairy tale. Very cool. So next is Linda. Hi, my name is Linda. Um, I work in the interlibrary loan and reference department. And so if you've talked to us about any interlibrary loans, I bet you've talked to me at some <laughs> point. Um, and the book that I'm chose, uh, one of the books that I chose is The Fisherman by Chigozie Obiyama. Um, this just came out in paperback, so mm -hmm. it is more affordable to get now. <laughs> and um, the book was shortlisted for the 2015 Man Booker Prize, which is an mm -hmm. international prize for first novels. Um, and Shikozi Obiyama is now, he's from Nigeria, but he is now a professor at UNL oh, and cool. teaches English. Mm -hmm. And I've taken a class from him. Mm -hmm. If you, if he is going to speak at an event that you're able to go to, I highly recommend it. He's really personable 
and entertaining. Um, the Fisherman is, I think, a, it's a good book for book groups or for individual reading because there's different ways you can read it. It's um, a book that you can delve into the symbolism, you can delve into the allegory, or you can just enjoy it as a narrative read with quite a bit of suspense. Um, it's set in 1990s Nigeria, and the narrator is Benjamin, who's the third of four sons. And he's just young enough that the world seems still like an idyllic place. He doesn't really understand what's going on in the world around him. But then things change for the family economically, and the father decides that the best choice for the family is for him to take a job at the Bank of Nigeria that's in a nearby city. So he is, he's absent sometimes. And this changes some things for the family. Um, and the, the boys spend some time out in the village and they end up meeting a, a kind of a crazy man, a local crazy man who prophesies that one member of the family is going to kill another member of the family. Hmm. And they don't believe him but their reactions <clears throat> to trying to avoid this happening or not believing it um, changes the way they interpret things that happen in their lives and um, affects their relationships. Um, the relationships, I think, are really the strongest point of the story, even though there is quite a bit of suspense, and I don't want to give too much away about that. Um, but... It talks about how decisions that parents make for families can sometimes be misinterpreted by children, um, even if parents think they're doing the best thing possible for the children in the family. Sometimes children don't really understand and think about it another way. And also, the relationship between the brothers is very interesting. I'm the youngest in my family. I'm not the third of four, but I'm the fourth of four. But um, the way the narrator talks about his older brothers and seeing them make decisions and seeing them become adults and maybe making decisions that he wouldn't make mm -hmm. is a really important process in his individuation as a human being. And you'll never love and hate somebody as much as an older sibling, I <laughs> yeah. don't think. Um, you really, you want their approval. I believe that, yeah, for my sister, the way my sister and I are together, yeah. You, know, um, you, you want their approval, you don't want their approval, you want them, you want to be around them, you want them to leave you alone. Um, and it's, it's told really well in this story. Um, it, it does take place in Nigeria. You don't really have to know anything about what's happening in Nigeria in the 90s. Um, to understand what's going on in the book. There are a few words in the vernacular languages, um, mm -hmm. but the meanings are made clear in the text around, so you might just learn a word or two, but mm -hmm. you don't need to know, you don't need to have any background of, about Nigerian history to understand the book. It, it could be set in Nebraska as well as in Nigeria. It's a story of a family and relationships and what expectations can do to us and and those relationships. Cool. All right, next up is Mary. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Mary Sowers. I'm the government information librarian here at the commission and um, actually government information kind of says it all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I help oversee the um, Nebraska State Documents Clearinghouse, uh, where we collect all of the state agency uh, publications that are meant for the public, and uh, we collect them in paper as well as online, um, and then help with, uh, we have some federal documents as well, um, but also uh, I'm part of the reference team uh, providing information and, and services uh, to the general public. So. Um, of the two books that I chose today, um, I chose my two favorites mm -hmm. uh, rather than first and last. <laughs> Although I'm, uh, I'm almost wondering if this one was my first one. But um, anyway, two of my favorites that I wrote about. Um, the first one is The Homesman by Glendon Swarthout. And um, this is one of those books that I picked up 
kind of by accident um, in an airport. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was in the airport bookstore just looking for something to read, picked it up because it had this picture of um, Tommy Lee Jones and uh, Hilary Swank on the front. And so I knew instantly that it was already a movie. <laughs> so that had yeah. an appeal. <laughs> and then when I read the back, I realized it was about Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And even though the author is not uh, from Nebraska, um, Glenn is fourth out and his wife um, came to Nebraska to do the research for this book. And they started out at UNL, did extensive research there. Uh, worked their way across the state going west um, to Kearney, uh, well, Grand Island, Kearney, and North Platte, um, and did a very extensive research on this, uh, this particular topic. And the topic of the homesman um, is based in 1850s Nebraska, but it is a devastating story of pioneer life while at the same time very fascinating. Uh, and it was not something, uh, a piece of pioneer history that we generally hear something about, um, but apparently was much more common than anybody knew. Um, and what we don't hear about is a lot of the brave pioneer women um, who actually lose their minds from the hardships and the uh, loss and um, lack the of support. lack of support, solitude, uh, solitude. The nutrition couldn't have been great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which probably, I mean, everything contributed. Can't and respond to a man's petty. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, and a lot of these women were so isolated from other women that they couldn't even get together to, um, you know, do a quilting bee. You know, like we hear so much about. It didn't happen in a lot of areas just because they were so isolated and even the, being able to go to a nearby town was a major event you know so these women were very isolated well unfortunately a lot of them I wouldn't say a lot quite a few lost their mental capacity they really did I mean they just could not cope anymore but um, their families couldn't cope with them either so the solution and apparently this did happen several times, was the solution was to find a person known as a homesman to escort these women back east to more populated areas and where they either had family that they could go back to or to um, a, a mental institution. Okay. And so the story of the homesman is about finding a homesman in uh, this particular area of Nebraska. The town involved is called Loop, which I believe is now Loop City, Nebraska. And um, um, Mary B. Cuddy, um, who is a, an ex-teacher and a spinster, owns her own homestead and is very concerned about these women along with some of the other men in the, in the community. Um, but nobody wants to volunteer. None of the men want to volunteer to take these women back to, uh, in this case, they're taking them to Iowa. So anyway, Mary B. Cuddy takes it upon herself to do it. Um, she can't find another man to go with her, so um, she comes accidentally comes across a claim jumper named George Briggs in the movie paid, played by Tommy Lee Jones. And um, the rest of the story is about their journey taking a wagon load of women back to Iowa, uh, to western Iowa to um, be taken care of. So it's, um, it was a 1988 Western Writers of America's, uh, America Award, um, a Western Heritage Wrangler Award. Um, the author's son has written a new afterward um, in the recent republication. And um, it was just a fascinating read from the minute that I picked it up. Had a hard time putting it down and even got an audio book so I wouldn't have to put it down. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I just had to keep reading. And um, while a lot of it was very shocking, it was definitely a good picture of um, a, a piece of pioneer life that we, you know, don't hear very much about. 
and uh, I highly recommend it. And the movie as well. The movie was excellent. I was going to ask you yeah. watch the movie too. Yeah, <laughs> um, actually the uh, movie was at the Ross. Oh, yeah, and okay. um, we had seen the movie trailer, you know, several mm -hmm. weeks, I guess, maybe even months before. I found the book, mm -hmm. and so when I saw the book, that kind of clicked, and I'm yeah. going, oh, maybe this does sound interesting, and then we went, after I read the book, we went back and saw the movie, and it was very good, as, as you know, uh, those two uh, Academy Award winning uh, um, yeah. you know, actors can make it, so, mm -hmm. yeah, highly recommend it. All right. Next is Sally. Okay. I'm Sally Snyder. I'm the Children and Teen Services Coordinator for the, the Commission. And I jumped right in at the first chance to be part of the Friday Reads. And I just want you to know, the very first book I talked about was an adult book. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You're allowed to that. Yes. That's that the only better. one so far. <laughs> but, yes. um, but I picked a couple of books that, that um, I really enjoyed. And, and kind of like you, kind of a couple of favorites. I thought, okay, I have to do a boy gr book and a girl book, kind of. So... <laughs> You know, my mindset was that way. But this one I, I talked about in June. The title is Up to This Point by Jennifer Longo. And Harper is 17, and she and her best friend Kate have had a plan for their futures since they were in sixth grade, and they're getting ready to graduate from high school. Their plan is to become ballerinas, share an apartment in their home city of San Francisco, and dance for the San Francisco Ballet. And they, I mean... These are some dedicated young women. I was <laughs> impressed. But things fall apart. Kate is on her way to their dream, and Harper is not, because her body can't do what Kate's body can do. She tries hard, but she just can't do some of the movements and, and bending that mm. Kate is built for. With her dream lost, Harper goes to Antarctica to winter over for six months, as a research assistant. That's a huge difference. That yes. is. And she's <laughs> going to get patch herself together. Um, this works out because the woman that she's going to be the assistant for was a mentee of Harper's mother. So there's a connection there, and that's how the author gets you to believe that, yes, she could be picked at the last minute to go on this trip. To, and she doesn't really follow science. She doesn't know anything much about Antarctica, mm. but there she is. And if, you know, this, this is the part of the story that really fascinated me was, and one of the reasons I picked up this book was, ooh, what would it be like to be somewhere where it's dark mm -hmm. and cold and you're inside most of the time and when you go outside, you better be putting a whole bunch of clothing on. And um, she spends a lot of, she does her work well. She is a good, she is good at organizing and, and putting the, the researchers' notes together. But she also is disconnected. She talks to her, her researcher, whose name I didn't put down here, and talks to the other assistant who kind of resents her getting on there so easy and doesn't know anything. But she's really good at the job she was given, which was organizing the notes. And she doesn't really talk to anybody else. And she doesn't want to go outside. She doesn't care. She just does get to go see the penguins that the research is about one time. And she was kind of loved that. But and slowly she she's having these visions of former explorers to that area where she's... It sounds almost like sort of a retreat or a, yeah. you know, going away to have that introspective experience. Mm -hmm. And that's what they... And actually the, the doctor there is the, the lady who's the medical person. She's not really a doctor is worried about her because she is languishing. Mm -hmm. So they have a greenhouse, and she sets up a hammock in the greenhouse for this girl to, to just get some sun and or pseudo sun because there mm -hmm. isn't any. And she just lays there and kind of lets the plants, you know, the aroma, and mm -hmm. she has these visions of former explorers. And then there's this young man who's kind of interested in her, and he, he helps to get her back coming back. She, um, she takes more time than I wanted her to <laughs> because I really did want to hit her upside the head a couple of times. As I said. <laughs> but we all know that people have to take the time they need to get to where they need to be. And, mm -hmm. and she does. And she does finally get back to being 
connected to people again. And, and actually, she's ultimately generous to an unlikable member of the Winter Over team. So it's an unusual setting for a, a young adult book, which is mm -hmm. one thing. And the ballet connection and Antarctica sound kind of Never put opposite. Them together. Yeah. yeah. Antarctica sounds really nice right now. Oh, <laughs> yes. Because it's so hot out. Yes. So hot. Yeah. 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 But I thought also the two people, Kate, oh, it, it's written in alternating chapters, Antarctica and San Francisco. So you get the past as to how she got to where she was and then where she is now. And it was... Um, it features two people who were really dedicated to their futures and approach it with unfailing intensity and effort, which is very admirable. And to lose that would be devastating, and it does take her quite a while to move ahead, but you have hopes for her as she's getting ready to leave Antarctica again. So I found it an, an intriguing read, and, and in the afterward, the author does say, this would never happen. A high school graduate would not get a research position their college students who get these positions, but she just thought, you know, this would be kind of intriguing, and so she wrote the story, which is pretty fascinating. Cool. All right, where we got here? Susan. Uh, there we go. Susan, you're up next. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Susan Nisley, and I work in the Technology and Access Services Department. Um, I work with the Nebraska Access Databases, Nebraska Overdrive, uh, subscription databases. Um, those are the probably the biggest uh, projects I'm involved with. Um, I'm glad we got to choose two books because I would have had trouble uh, picking between <laughs> these two. I think these two are probably um, the two I'm going to talk about today are the ones I, I feel almost evangelical about. <laughs> um, during the periods of time when I was reading them, I couldn't stop talking about them with with uh, the people around me. Um, the first uh, one is Becoming Nicole, A Transformation of an American Family, and this is about, um, this came out uh, in October 2015, and I think I read it in November. Yeah. This was the same time period when the um, Houston Equal Rights Ordinance was on the ballot, and that's really when the whole transgender individuals and bathroom access issue really, I think, really hit the mainstream uh, media. Um, I'm sure, I know there have been issues prior to that and news stories, but that seems when it, like when it really blew up. Um, and so this was, I thought, the perfect book to come out at this time, and I so wished that we could somehow make it a requirement for people to read it before they um, made comments uh, on the news or in response to news stories. Um, what's so interesting about this book is um, it's not written by a transgender individual. It's written by a reporter, uh, Amy Ellis Nutt, and it's written about a whole family. What's so interesting in this particular case is that um, it's a couple who wound up adopting children. The children were identical twin boys, um, Jonas and Wyatt. Uh, so, you know, same DNA, same genetics, same uh, environment that they grew up in. Um, and it was very clear from very early on, you know, based on the multiple anecdotes that were mm. related in the story, that the children viewed themselves and their gender identity very differently. Mm -hmm. um, by the time he was two, Wyatt was clearly interested in stereotypically girl things, um, was upset about being a boy. He wasn't even three, and he was asking his parents, you know, when he would become a girl, when... Mm -hmm. um, you know, when he would get rid of his male anatomy so that he could be a girl. So you have a child who's barely verbal, and yet they're Already still knows. able yeah. to verbalize. Mm -hmm. the same parents, same environment. You have, um, uh, you know, and, and the uh, author of this book said she watched, you know, hours of home video, and she said it was so compelling to see these two children and how different they were. Um, as far as family dynamics go, um, again, 
these are not parents you would probably think of as being on the fringes in terms of how they want to bring up their children in terms of gender identity or stereotypes. Um, the father in particular was describes himself as fairly conservative. You know, he was into hunting and guns and couldn't wait to introduce his two boys to those sorts of activities. Um, the mother was the one who was most sensitive to uh, Wyatt's differences and his struggles, and she's the one that started doing all the research. Um, so I think this would have been in the 90s. Um, gosh, because the kids are eight, over 18 now, so it would have been oh, wow. in the late 90s. And the internet and online searching wasn't no. as robust then as it was now, but she, you know, as you would imagine a mother would do if they were concerned and scared for their child, you know, she started doing all this research before her child even started school to try to understand this. And she'd do searches and she'd come up with transgender as the, the topic. And so she made connections with experts and other people in the state and learned as much as she could. And she sort of tried to walk that line between supporting Wyatt, you know, if he wanted to play with girls' toys or grow his hair long, those sorts of things, and her husband was very uncomfortable with it. And you can see throughout the story, it's, there is a lot of tension, I think, in the family. He sort of distances himself. He's not comfortable with it. He doesn't understand it. He's not particularly supportive of his wife's efforts, so she basically is on her own having to do this research and battle with the school. and or. That's, in the early years, it wasn't so much battling, but she'd have to intervene or talk to parents or before, uh, you know, a birthday party or a sleepover, you know, make sure everything was going to be okay. And, um, it's interesting because in elementary school, um, things went fairly well. Um, Wyatt's friends were all girls. They play. Uh, they they, they, the girls accepted uh, him as one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and what's so interesting is it wasn't the kids that had problems with it. The kids were very it's accepting. Usually, yeah. Yeah, um, there's one anecdote even about a, it was another couple and their kids that had done something with the Maines family. And the mother, after the fact, had said something to her child about, oh, and the Maines boys. And her child, this is—they were probably nine or younger. And her son said, "No, it's not. It's a boy and a girl. It's not." <laughs> mm -hmm. And the mother was even to the point where she was saying, um, "But, you know, I don't know if they something, but she, you know, brought up something that was almost irrefutable uh, to say that it's a boy." And he's like, "Well." He's still, it's still a girl, <laughs> you know, I mean, even, you know, in, in the face of this incontrovertible evidence, he's like, no, it's Kids a girl. like, no, yeah. Um, and Jonas, Wyatt's twin, was also very supportive of uh, Wyatt, who became Nicole. Um, at one point, he told his father, again, I think they're about nine, he's like, face, face it, Dad, you have a son and a daughter. You know, he's spoken mm -hmm. On this issue, as a, as an older teen, and he said, as far as he was concerned, he always had a sister. It wasn't an issue for him; it was just something that he knew. So it was so powerful. Um, they eventually end up having problems in the school system because one grandfather gets upset when he hears that there's um, a transgender child who is using the girls' restroom, and he has a fit, and he actually encourages his son to start harassing um, Nicole, start following her into the girls' restroom and say that if she gets to be there, that he gets to be there. Um, and it became a huge issue, so then the school banned Nicole from using the girls' restroom, forced her to use the staff restroom. Of course, there started to be harassment from other students. Nicole, uh, who had been, you know, doing fairly well, really, you know, became distressed and upset, and so the family ended up having to remove the kids from school. The mother and the kids moved to another community where Nicole could go stealth mm -hmm. under the radar, and they did end up suing the school district and 
ultimately, a number of years later and many dollars later, um, they did win uh, it in the uh, state Supreme Court against the school district. Um, and the father, at the point it started, at that point, um, when things got bad, the father came through and he really became the primary um, person who went out and lobbied uh, representatives, who mm -hmm. gave speeches, who, um, you know, he really got on board. And, and he will talk about that. Um, he, you know, he he speaks regularly on the issue, and he writes uh, letters and essays, and he'll talk. Oh, he's about, still involved in. Oh the, yeah, cool. you know, he, he'll talk about his transformation. And mm -hmm. I watched a video of him at an award ceremony talking, and he almost teared up because he talked about how he wasn't there for mm -hmm. his wife and his kids when they were younger. And, mm -hmm. So it's it's just a really compelling story, and I think it's really timely. So. Mm -hmm. yeah, very much so. Cool. All right. And we're back to me again. Um, the other book, as I said, I had chosen just the first and the last book that I had written about in Friday Reads so far. Um, and this is my most recent one just last month, uh, Seneca Falls Inheritance by Miriam Grace Manfredo, or Manfredo, I'm not sure, Manfredo probably. Um, and this is actually a book about a librarian. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's, I, I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not exactly sure if that's how I first started, read this book. I've had this book for years. Um, I think I was, got it from my mother when I was in high school or college or something. I'd, I'd have to check exactly when it was written. Um, but when it's first out, because I have this cover is the original hardcover um, dust jacket picture of it. It doesn't look like this anymore. If you look it up now, you'll find this buried in other ones. But um, that's the one that I have. Um, uh, Seneca Falls Inheritance takes place actually in 1848 in upstate New York, so it's in my hometown, during the first women's rights convention for suffrage um, that Elizabeth Cady Stanton helped to arrange. Um, it, it is fiction. It's not, um, it's not, uh, it's a mixture of fiction and actual historical events because it does take place during that convention and it does talk about things that were actually happening. So you learn a little bit about the history, but then it's, um, the fictional part is the um, story that's being told, which is about this librarian named Glynis Tyrant Tryon who is librarian in Seneca Falls, New York, where um, the first women's rights convention took place. And coincidentally, and this is not how on purpose, uh, that actually took place July 19th and 20th, which is today, <laughs> in 1848. And I, this was not planned at all. We picked this date because we were available. And then I picked my books afterwards, and it just happened to be the most recent one I, I put in there. I don't know. So, um, so... Yeah, and I've seen a lot of things this week coming up on my Facebook and social media about the anniversary of it, and I was like, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> so it just it just happened. So um, uh, where's my post here again? Glen uh, Glennis is the librarian in the town, and um, she is asked by Elizabeth Kitty Stanton to help actually organize the convention. Now, as I said, that's the fictionalish part, so she may or may not, but this, it did take place in the town. Um, that was a bit of a controversy for her as the librarian. She had been told by the board, you, you know, don't make waves. You're just, you know, don't put anything controversial in the library. We hired you just to be, you know, stereotypical. Historian. Oh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so, um, that, so she was trying to figure out, well, do I, you know, I got to pay attention to what the, the board tells me, but I really want to get involved in this movement, women's suffrage. We do need, you know, the right to vote and all of that. So it's also a very um, important book in what's coming up with our elections right now, which we'll not talk about. Um, so she did get her, so Elizabeth Katie Stanton did convince her to talk to other women in this community and to get the thing going. So she did help with running that. Um, however, that's not exactly what the book's about. It is a murder mystery. So this is one of those, um, I don't know if people drive it as a cozy murder mystery. It's got that typical thing, but it's got the historical too. So historical fiction, mystery um, going on. Um, there's been um, a couple, um, a major um, couple in town has died in an accident and killed in an accident. There were big people in town. And um, their, their son is assumed that he will inherit um, their wealth. They were um, two of the most prominent citizens in town, and they died in, a, in an accident in, on the Erie Canal. Nothing weird about that, just it happened. Um, but then this woman shows up in town, 
who seeks out the librarian looking for help, maybe because they know that women research, I don't know, she could do research for her, and wants to talk to her um, about um, something. So she's looking for the librarian and hasn't been able to find her, but she hears she's looking for her. Um, but then she is discovered murdered. And that's where the mystery comes in. Who is this woman? Why is she coming looking for the librarian in town? Um, what's it have to do with the other couple that has been murdered um, and what's going on? So um, then Glen Glennis just helps with um, this sheriff in town who's a friend of hers, maybe boyfriend eventually, um, uh, figure out who what, what happened. Um, so it's a really great murder mystery, actually, just on its own. It's, it's very fun, um, fast-paced, interesting, a lot of crazy, you know, tied twists and whatnot, but then with the background of the Women's Rights Convention and feminism and what's going on with that. So it's got a little bit of everything that I liked um, about it for those reasons. Um, I've been to Seneca Falls as well. I went visiting there with my mom and my sister. I think it was with my mom for um, a trip oh, one time. I still live back in New York um, to visit all these locations. So it was kind of cool to read about places I had been to um, in the book. Um, and I've reread this book a couple of times now since I got it, so I've obviously uh, liked it a lot. Um, the author, um, Miriam um, Grace Manfredo, she is actually a historian and a former librarian. Oh. So she knows her stuff <laughs> um, and the librarian related things. But it's also, you know, 1848 librarian -ish, librarianship, but still. Um, she knows what she's talking about. It was she, She's got all those parts and the historical historian part, she's, you know, really good at that. Um, Glynis is a great librarian. She's smart. She's stubborn. She's educated, which would not be very difficult. But this is, as you were talking about pioneer time, this is East Coast, yes, New York. So a whole different, different you know, um, things going on there at the time. So um, it's really, really good, really, yeah, fun book. Um, and it reminded me that, and I, I didn't even realize this, I was thinking about you know, what I was going to say about this book, that both books I talked about today um, have librarians in them. This one, the main character is, but um, also in the Fables series, there is a librarian in that as well as one of them, which you'd not think of that there's a, is there a fairy tale about librarian? No. Uh, what this, what Bill Lilling has decided is that, and just take it as it is, one of the flying monkeys from the Wizard of Oz, <laughs> Buffkin, is a librarian. And he's an actual, like, he, they, people go to him for research help, just like this woman was coming to Glennis for research help. So when they need to find something out or go through all the old historical tomes, you go to the librarian in the Fable Town, too. So very interesting. Um, this is also the first one in a series. There are now, I think she ended up with five books. Um, yes, five more titles. Okay, so there's six total. So this is a series. So if you get started with this one, and I've already read the, I've gotten through the first three of them, I think, and I've got to start picking up some of the other ones now that I, I kind of fall, fell off of it when I was, you know, get involved in other things. <laughs> um, yes, life so, happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so after the, you know, the convention's over, there's still things going on in Glennis's life that um, other, it's a whole, you know, series of weird mystery, mystery type books. Isn't it wonderful when there's more books after the one? Yes. And they're already published. <laughs> exactly, Yay. yes. I, I don't have to, to wait yeah. For a few of these that I've written for, there's another book that I wrote about on Friday Reads, um, uh, The Missing Ink, which is also a murder mystery about a tattoo artist. And when I started reading that one, it was the first one. Oh. And, I, and I was like, and I knew she was writing more, that author. And I had to wait and wait. By the time I wrote about it, though, they were all out. Oh, good. So I was like, you guys are lucky. You get to read them all one after another. <laughs> I had to wait like six months for each one to come out to read the next one. <laughs> but now, yeah. yeah. We are back to Linda. Um, so the next book I chose is uh, Cinderella Eight, My Daughter by Peggy Orenstein. This just sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I said before, I do interlibrary loan here, and I had a personal moment of triumph after uh, this one on the Friday Reads blog because we got an interlibrary loan request for the book yeah. later that morning. Oh, that's so nice. cool. And, and Somebody was paying it attention. <laughs> See, it's nice when people pay attention to these. I, I, that reminds me, too, the one that I just talked about, the author commented on our blog. Oh, that's even about my, oh, my, when she's, obviously, you know, you Google yourself as you're an artist, yeah. she, and she said, oh, thank you so much. I can't believe people are still reading my books, this book that's <laughs> sold. So, um, yeah, she, she, I, was, I saw the post, the thing pop up saying, hey, there's a comment on your post. Like, really? Oh, wow. All right. And she's still out there writing new things. Yeah. Oops. Oops. Switch. Ah, whoops. I hit the keyword. Sorry. <laughs> um, so Peggy Orenstein is an accomplished writer and cultural critic, and when she had a daughter, 
She was going to offer her a positive childhood experience that didn't revolve around her daughter being pretty or a princess or being limited by anything that would be limited but because she's a girl. And what she encounters in real life is a consumer, consumer culture that's very different than the one she grew up in. And it's one that has a lot of appeal for her daughter. Um, I noticed when I started working in libraries how different the books offered to children mm -hmm. were than they were when I was young. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of princesses. There's a lot of pink. There's a lot of um, uh, different themes marketed that just weren't there when I was young. And if you go into stores and look at toys and clothes, it's the same thing. Um, everything's pink. <laughs> everything's, uh, it, it, it's a lot different than when we were young. And she wanted to take a look at, at how that happened. Hmm. Um, so she takes a very personal approach to the story. Um, her, she has a, a great desire for her daughter to be happy, but to try and still have um, positive messages for her. Um, so she does take a very balanced and nuanced tone about complicated topics. Um, she also lets you know that she's still, she's a human being. She talks about when she doesn't handle her frustration very well, when she takes her four-year-old daughter to a store and the daughter wants to buy these hyper-sexualized, those brats dolls, and mm -hmm. she doesn't want to, that's not what she wants for her four-year-old daughter. Um, so it is, in one sense, it's a classic story about a child and a parent having different ideas about identity and a parent having to learn about how to let their child have their own ideas in the safest environment that the parent can provide. Um, but like I said, she's not judgmental. She goes to visit some toddler beauty pageants, which is another thing that wasn't around when she was young. Um, and she talks to the families, and she she doesn't judge them, but she talks about what, what they're getting out of it, what they're looking for, um, but also lets you know, I mean, they are being exploited by the industry. They, it, it's, ex, it's an expensive industry. Um, and the one thing that really stuck with me from the book uh, is the description of the processes that companies use to market to children. There's a story about how um, a couple of Disney executives went to a Disney on Ice production, and I believe in the 80s. And one of the Disney executives looked around, and he saw all these girls in their homemade costumes that they had made or that their parents had made um, to look like the characters that were out on the ice. And they said, we are losing out on so much money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need oh, yeah. to make these costumes and sell them these costumes. And that was one of the, uh, Disney really changed. They had mm -hmm. previously never allowed um, more than one Disney, more than one uh, Disney story in to be present at the same time, like, uh, Sleeping Beauty and Snow White existed in completely different uh -huh. worlds. They could never be on the same sheet set or the same uh, action figure. Uh -huh. Yeah, they never interacted. And even still, this may have changed recently, but even still when you see them in, um, if they were on, say, like some wallpaper or curtains for a girl's room, they never make eye contact with each other. Oh, interesting. Unless they're in the same story. Yeah. Wow. I now no I have to that. look at that. Yeah, no <laughs> all, a lot of the princesses in pictures together, and I just kind of assumed that meant they were all together somewhere. Yeah, but, oh, well, yeah they, they don't interact. Um, the one thing I thought was funny about the, the paperback copy I have is um, People Magazine calls it funny, and Vanity Fair calls it blood chilling. So <laughs> that's a, that's a nice. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's different ways to insight into two yeah. different magazines. <laughs> so it's. Yeah. Um, I would recommend it to anybody who has kids or works with kids, or anybody who's just. I was just curious about the generational differences in mm -hmm. how things are marketed to girls because it is different now than when I was young. Um, mm -hmm. And she has a new book out now called girls and sex that's about how to talk to your daughter about sex that's gotten some good reviews mm -hmm. um cool. so yeah i recommend the book right. as you saw when i tapped the keyboard by accident <laughs> <laughs> this is what's up, up next <laughs> um the second one that i chose to talk about and um is probably one of my all-time favorite 
titles as well as series. And in fact, I love this series so much, I've read it three times mm -hmm. and I've listened to it on audio. Um, it's just, I, I think the fascination for me is that the plot line is about time travel. Mm -hmm. I've always been fascinated with it. Um, I like shows about time travel. I like books about time mm -hmm. travel. And um, I, for a while, I wasn't sure if it was just because I wanted to change the past somehow. Mm -hmm or if it was a, just a desire to experience different time period. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, um, like a teenager, it was more of a romantic view of, well, things would be better if I went back to this time travel. And that is very romantic view of it. Um, <laughs> and actually, you know, the older I get, the more I realize, no, things were yeah. not well, you something like good. Uh, yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yes, I would not want to go back there, you know. <laughs> so anyway, um, Outlander by Diana Gabaldon um, starts out in 1945. Uh, Claire Randall, who is a former combat nurse in World War II, is back from the war and reunited with her husband on a second honeymoon. They visit one of the uh, stone circles that are found all over the British Isles, similar to Stonehenge, and she accidentally touches one of the stones um, during the summer solstice, mm -hmm. and which happens to be, um, and I don't know a whole lot about uh, pagan mythology, but it happens to be a very important date and things can happen. Well, it happened to her and she is suddenly thrown back um, to um, 18th century Scotland, 1743, um, and hurled back in time by forces she doesn't begin to understand because nothing like this has ever happened to her. Um, she becomes, uh, her destiny is intertwined with Clan Mackenzie. Um, their home base is Castle Lyot. And she is um, immediately taken up into what's going on in 1743 Scotland, which, uh, if anybody knows anything about Scottish history, is only two or three years before um, the Battle of Culloden, and uh, which changed uh, clans and Scotland forever. Um, so anyway, um, it's it's a series that. Um, Ms. Gabaldon has researched very well. So not only is it a time travel and as a um, genre kind of falls into the fantasy you know, world, uh, but she's done an excellent job so that it becomes a historical fiction. Um, she does, she has talked about everything from what's going on in England and where Bonnie Prince Charlie is and what he's doing and everything leading up to Outlander, um, as well as Claire's uh, life and um, the man she becomes involved with, Jamie Fraser, who's you know the other main character in these, um, and how they, how she's torn between her husband um, back in 1945. Um, and her um, soon-to-be husband in 1743. So <laughs> uh, anyway, really love the books. Um, in fact, uh, the series is so well written. There are eight of them now in the series with some little novellas you know, in between. She's uh, spun off some characters into their own series, um, and uh, it is also has also just finished its second season as a star's, uh, television series. Um, and Ms. Gabaldon is also involved in the series, uh, television series like J George R. R. Martin is uh, with Game of Thrones. So the series, if you get a chance to watch it, is really, really close to the books. And uh, mm -hmm. and, and needless to say, I've been watching them. <laughs> so anyway, highly recommended uh, the is book she, and the series. Is she still writing new books in this no. series, or she's no. ended her she has books? In, have yes, ended, she yeah. has ended the series. Um, yeah. And uh, kind of interestingly, mm -hmm. you know, was not expecting the way she you know ended the story, but you know could kind of understand you know 
where she went with it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, and, it was really fun. And you got Michael to watch the series. Oh, right? yeah, he's just as much into it as I am. <laughs> because you know. the initial, I mean, it's marketed as kind of a romance. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But I, and would, I know he said yeah. he was skeptical, but he yes. sounded like he was really yes. into it. John it has is. caught, because so, we have stars, John yeah. has watched a few. I've come home, he's watching. John, <laughs> like, what are you watching? And he had never heard about the book. He didn't know what he was getting into. I don't know a show outlander i'm like oh my gosh uh, yeah. <laughs> okay yes. do you know what you're watching no but it's really cool it's historical and yes i'm like all right exactly cool. <laughs> and, and michael you know said after the first couple of episodes he said i'm not sure why but i'm really liking <laughs> this you know and i think is because you know the scottish um clansmen are a very uh warrior-like people mm -hmm. um you know there's fighting and uh swords and guns antique guns you know mm -hmm. um and an epic kind and, of yes, it, it is, is yeah. very epic. Yes, yeah. it has. You know, so I really think it appeals to everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, not just not just to the romance. And I mean, obviously, the romance is part of it, mm -hmm. but it's not the main focus there's of it. You know, it. there's and, much yeah. more historical stuff going on. So. Well, I read a couple of the books, and my the, the scene that I remember the most is when Claire notices someone else with a smallpox vaccine. Yes. Back in the uh, uh, yes. uh, uh -huh. 1800s. Yes. Really yeah, long. and another incident where she comes across a skull in the woods that has a filling, oh. you know, and, and yeah, she's yeah. gone, a, a silver filling, and uh -huh. she's gone, ooh, this is not 1743. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, and, and there she does actually meet up with uh, a fellow time traveler. And, uh, and well, she although, can't be the first one that touched a rock at the uh, right time. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Whether either accidentally yeah. on or, or on purpose. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, really good series. <laughs> wow. All right. And we're back to Sally. It's going to scream at some monsters. Oh, yeah. Which you happens must. a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I wrote this one in April of 2015 because at that point, um, I was getting ready for this summer summer reading program, so I was mm. reading books about get in the game, read, on your market set, read, and this one, of course, is about baseball and umpires. Casey so Snowden, who's 12, his father and grandfather run a sanctioned school for baseball umpires, and Casey and his best friend Zeke help each fall. The school is in the fall. And this September, they only have 80 students instead of the usual 100s, and Casey's mm. beginning to worry about the future. He wants to be a sports writer. He doesn't want to run the umpire school, but he knows this is his father's calling, and he's starting to worry about what will happen for his father. Well, as things go along, he's writing for the school newspaper, and, and um, uh, one day he realizes that because they only have 80 students, one instructor is not there, and he's the instructor who usually organized and ran the culminating event, You Suck Ump Day, <laughs> which is a lot harder to say than to read. <laughs> um, so at that day, they have many people from the town gather around, and they sit in the stands, and they yell things and throw sanctioned things because they're more controlling here in this school than, than in, in the, the real, real world. In an actual stadium, yeah. yeah. Um, at the uh, students, so that the ump students can really get a sense of what is it like to have everybody yelling at you and throwing things. So they and prepare them for the real them what's going to happen. Now. And along with that, there are throughout the book uh, s situations in the class because he's helping. Um, there's one student who has to keep being told to speak up, to be confident. Mm -hmm. If you're going to yell strike, yell strike. If you're going to yell out, yell out. Don't say out. He has to really project confidence, and that's kind of a life lesson for the boy as well. You know. Well, so they decide the, the, that Casey and Zeke are, Zeke are going to run the You Suck Ump Day themselves, and, uh, and it goes pretty well. There's another side story in there as he's working on practicing to be a sports writer. He notices that one of the students in the ump school this year is a former baseball pro who went through a drug issue um, hoopla and is now in this hump school looking toward his future. He got straightened out and he's thinking, wow, this is a great story. I can break this story and I'll be great. And, and But fortunately, over time, he begins to realize that that's not the right thing to do. And he talks with the guy. So there's a, a number of levels of things going on in this dad's life's work. Um, but what really grabbed me about this, and you know, I have to say, I'm not the first in line 
for sports books. <laughs> so it really made me laugh when we chose this theme for this summer because I thought, oh gosh, all I'm going to read are sports books <laughs> left and right. But this one grabbed me because of the title and the picture on the cover. And then the thought of the You Suck Ump Day, which sounds hilarious, and I want to go. Can I be in the crowd? I yeah. would go. <laughs> but um, everything that came together in the book, it's, it's a real fun look at the mind of a 12-year-old and what it takes to be an umpire. And so we also have a page that I looked at after I read the book, and I put this on my Friday reads. And this is the official Major League Baseball page about how – to enroll in a school. It's and an actual thing to enroll in school and learn how to be one. Where yeah. they are. There's two schools. This was the third. It doesn't really exist. <laughs> Just those two do. But it was fascinating to read the information here on this page about really becoming a baseball umpire. So maybe somebody will be inspired to go check that out and try mm -hmm. it. It was a fun book and also works great for this summer, summer reading program. Mm -hmm. Very cool. All right. And our final book to wrap up is Susan. Okay. Um, my final book is the book that I just did a Friday Reads on. It's Grasshopper Jungle by Andrew Smith. Um, I hardly ever read or listen to a book more than once, even if I love it. Um, this book, I listened to it twice. I listened to it the first time. I listened to it a second time, and I actually ordered a used copy through Amazon so I'd have the print. Um, wow. And being able to flip through the print, it was a good reminder that sometimes you notice things when you see it in writing that you don't when you're listening. It's really hard to flip back uh, on audio to re-find a passage and to really like reinforce maybe, oh, there is a connection between this passage and this passage. Um, I'm not patient enough to try to fiddle with my <laughs> uh, device to get back to the exact right section. Um, this is a book that I just, for some reason, just absolutely loved it. Um, and I've been trying to get everyone around me to read it, and nobody else loves it as much as me. <laughs> the people that I'm getting to read it are people that I often connect with, with over books. You know, we'll often react the same way to this book or that book. Nobody else loves it quite as much as me. So it's been interesting. It's been an interesting process just to try to figure out, okay, what is it about it that makes it speak so much to me? And I feel like if I figure that out, I'll figure out something about myself as a person. <laughs> um, so what's it about? Um, on the surface, it's about uh, two 16-year-old boys, um, uh, Robbie Breeze and Austin Zerba. Austin Zerba is the narrator, so I guess he's the main character. Um, and it set in a fictional town, Ealing, Iowa, economically depressed. Um, and there is uh, some things happen and a plague uh, uh, is released. Basically, uh, there are these six foot tall praying mantises that are uh, eating people <laughs> in the town. It's basically uh. <laughs> apocalyptic. Yeah. Um, wow. And the boys are I wouldn't say they're responsible, but they're kind of involved. Um, uh, they see what happens. They're, they know what's going on. They're probably the only people in the world who know what's going on. Um, so on the one hand, you've got this really, uh, really, um, you know, science fiction type plot, mm -hmm. which it's not a plot. It's not the type of plot that I would normally go for. On the other hand, you have this really compelling main character, narrator, who is incredibly introspective, who's incredibly honest. Um, and at some level, I think it doesn't really matter what the sort of ostensible plot of the book is. I almost mm -hmm. think it could be some, I it's almost like there has to be some sort of plot going on just as a foil or backdrop for the, these characters and their relationships, but it could have been anything. Mm -hmm. In some ways, I don't think that, I mean, they have a lot of fun with the particular uh, plot devices and the events, but it could have been anything. What really compelled me was the main character. And one of the things that's really uh, unique is that he is he, he, <clears throat> he realizes that he is uh, in love with and attracted to his girlfriend and also his best friend, Robbie, who is gay. Um, and so he's very confused about this. Uh, but he's also very honest. He never tries to... Uh, 
hide it from himself or um, squelch it or suppress it or whatever, re repress it. Mm -hmm. um, he's very honest with himself. He's confused. Um, he's also, this is a, kind of an interesting uh, device throughout. The book starts out talking about recording history and how do we record history. And he's really interested in history. And he has been writing journals recording his own history, the story of his life. And so he's always trying to get down everything that happened um, and trying to be as honest as possible. Um, so between his interest in how do we record history, what all is related to everything else. So you know he's got these weird digressions in the book that can almost be annoying, but yet it has something to do with how he views history. Um, that things that seem unrelated are related, and if this didn't happen 200 years ago in uh, Poland, then this wouldn't be happening uh, in contemporary time in Iowa. So um, so there's a lot of, you know, he thinks a lot about that. Um, somewhere I read that Andrew Smith, uh, that somebody wrote to him and, and basically complained that there, you know, and I don't know if it was about this book or one of his other books, but complaining that there's no teenage boy that's that introspective. Or, <laughs> and, you know, and his response was, uh, I was pretty introspective when I was that age. I thought a lot about mm -hmm. a lot of things. So um, it's a very different book. When he wrote it, he didn't think that he had sort of stopped writing for public. He thought he had stopped writing for publication um, mm -hmm. at the time because of um, some something that was written uh, in the I think it was the Wall, Wall Street Journal maybe um, talking about YA literature and how dark it was and mm -hmm. he was named his he was the first author named as sort of an example of this dark yeah. you know how how dark this. Um, some YA literature is, and it really upset him, and so he sort of had decided he wasn't going to write for publication anymore, so he wrote this thinking nobody was going to read it. Um, uh, and he talks about the fact that his son had just gone away for college for the first time, so he was missing his son, and he said his son is probably missing him because his son contacted him and asked his dad to send him something that he'd written. He wanted to read some of his dad's writing, so his dad sent him this and said, uh, Okay, but you have to tell me if you think I need therapy after you're, <laughs> you're done reading it. Um, and obviously, I think his son really liked it, and somehow some published you convinced know, him to somebody get it convinced published. him to publish it. Mm -hmm. It is very different than I've read subsequently some of his other um, YA novels, and I would say this is very different. Um, is this one still marketed as YA though? It's marketed really? as okay. YA. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, and he actually has, I think, spoken on this topic of what is YA literature. Mm -hmm. Is it um, literature that is written for that particular age group and is and is made to be appropriate for that age group, or mm -hmm. is it written about that particular time in your life mm -hmm. when you're going through all those changes? And he says he writes about that time period because it was such mm -hmm. a formative time period for him and going mm -hmm. back retrospectively and trying to explore those issues in that period of time is a way to, you know, think about mm -hmm. and that's how we become who we are. And so that's that sort of his school. would be of interest to anyone at any age. Right. Those of us, I mean, you were talking about when you were younger, what you thought about time travel and oh, stuff. Sure. And now you're, yes. you read it at a totally different uh, point of view. Yeah, it's <laughs> much more realistic. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's good, yeah, to read about, you know, like someone who was like you when you were a child mm -hmm. or a teenager. Oh, but as an adult age. trying to figure out why am I the way I am now? Mm -hmm. Is it from this? And then this story mm -hmm. can help me. Yeah. And of course, he has stories about mm -hmm. kids who've written to him saying, God, or, or, or adults that have written to him, kids saying, I'm so, you know, this makes me feel so bad, so much better about myself. Mm -hmm. Or adults saying, I wish I'd had this to read when I was that age, mm -hmm. going, having some of these thoughts and feelings. Yeah. Them, so. I kind of feel that way about Judy Bloom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll stop there. That's <laughs> Maybe great. somebody will email you about having read it. And yeah, I know. Feeling the same way you do. I know. I, yeah. I, I made uh, Lisa Kelly. Uh, she really, uh, I guess you would say she humored me and she listened to it. <laughs> I don't think she hated it, but she said she has no idea who she'd recommend it to. Like she couldn't think of anybody mm. she'd necessarily recommend it to that it was a good fit for. 
Sarah. So I'm still trying to make everyone I know read it. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound very interesting. Like from just well looking at it, you wouldn't know what it's next about. Uh, right. Um, and it, so it's kind of a um, I don't know what I call it clandestine, subtle yeah. out thing where it, you know you're like. Subtle. It doesn't scream YA. It doesn't scream apocalyptic, weird, mm -hmm. whatever's going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that but is a it nice is, cover. It is. Yeah. Been, um, I think it has been optioned for a movie. And the I was thinking as you're describing, that, uh, this sounds like a the movie. The director that they sort of have on tap is the guy who did Shaun of the Dead. <gasps> so, really? Oh, what? Simon yeah. Pegg um, as the actor or the director? The director. Oh, the director. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Oh, wow. Okay. Keep my eyes open. That could be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You'll have to keep us updated on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. That's our last book that we had to talk about today. Um, we did run over, but that's okay. We, we go as long as we need to on this show. Um, anybody has any questions, comments? I know you didn't throughout. You can let us know. But I think we will just um, wrap it up quickly um, since we are running a little long today. I am going to pop back over, if I can find my mouse, to our website here. Um, as I said, the way um, we do, this is um, a series we've been doing on our blog, and if you go here on the Library Commission website and then go to Encompass, which is our main um, Library Commission blog, and, and search for Friday, oh, wrong keyboard, too many computers, <laughs> Friday Reads. Well, you get first is today's show because that's the most recent thing. But um, if you just scroll down, you will see, um, you'll get a list of all our ones. And then, like, as Susan said, the most recent one that's been done was last week's, um, her book. But you can just scroll through all these and see all of the different titles that have been written about. Doesn't Amy maintain a page that just lists all the writers? I was wondering about that. I don't know. if Did she have something? I think I she know. was organizing. She, I think yeah. there may be somewhere. Uh, if This is how I went to look for it just to see how long we've been doing it. Um, let me do a search and see if I can find it. Oops. On just um, the commission site. Mm -hmm. You have to click the. Yeah. Okay. Try the best. Um, oh the well, top. look here. Book reviews by NLC staff. I think Amy maintains this page. Yes. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's also here where you, and this will just pop you to each one of them. Mm -hmm. Medical by author. Divided by fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Nice. So yeah. So you go here and find all the different ones that all of us have ever written about and see who. Um, that's not spelled right. We'll have to that. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's spelled right other places on that same page. I so yeah. have to talk to her about oh, some yeah. of this because oh, that's here. definitely a little too that's much. That's not your first name. Um, too much, oh. uh, I don't need that kind of pressure. Yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, go here, you'll see all the books that we've written about. You want to see what everybody here at the commission has been doing. <laughs> um, I didn't know that was there, so that's fun. And you know, yeah, that will be linked to from the show notes then. All right. Um, we'll get back to Encompass Live then. So that wraps up for today's show. Thank you everyone for watching and hearing about all of our um, our titles that we've been done doing. As I said, we just picked two from each of us. We've all done more than that, I think. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot more out there to read. Two years worth every Friday. Well, that 100 and something books we're at by now. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, it'll keep going. As I said, Laura Johnson started up. Amy has taken it over and she is determined to keep it going. Okay. So um, keep your eyes out for any of our new um, recommendations. Um, Encompass Live, the show you're watching, um, if you just Google that anywhere, um, luckily so far, I don't know what this is, but nobody's named anything our show, so you can just Google us and find us yeah. right there. Easy. Um, the show has been recorded, as it always is, and right here beneath our upcoming shows is where our link is to our archives. So you can click there, and you'll see all of our previous shows listed here. And let's see, last week we had, yeah, our recording goes up on YouTube. The presentation will go up on our slide share. I'll put these slides up if you want to see them. And then we'll have links to um, uh, Sally's page about umpires and that page with our list of all the titles of all the Friday Reads books if you're interested in um, checking those out. Um, so... That's where this show will be uh, by later this afternoon, I'll say, as long as everything processes quickly and YouTube's up to speed. Um, it shouldn't take me too long to get that up there. 
Um, I hope you join us next week when our topic is the Queer Omaha Archives. This is a new um, collection at the University of Nebraska at Omaha in their Chris Library, um, where they are now um, preserving and collecting any um, resources about the history of um, people in, in our area, actually. So it's actually it's called the Queer Omaha because it is specific to the Omaha region in this Midwest area. So um, they're reaching out and finding any sort of documentation and materials and things to collect into one place. Um, I heard about it on Facebook. A friend of mine mentioned it, and they had their recently their official grand opening last month, month before, just this summer. I don't remember exactly the date. Um, but we'll find out because Amy Schindler, who's the director of archives and special collections at UNO, will be with us um, to talk about this new um, um, collection that they've got um, put together. So that should be really fun. Um, well, interesting. So join us next week for that and for any of our other topics. You see that we've got all the way through August scheduled here, and I'm always adding more, so keep an eye open for the ones coming up after next week's. We are also on uh, Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, you can pop over to Facebook and like our page. And if it gets, there we go. Um, yeah, Facebook has this new pop-up here. Um, yeah. Like our page, you'll see reminders of um, when the new show, like I reminded people today, log in for today's show, when the recording. reminded people? I reminded people, <laughs> reminder. I post reminders. To, I <laughs> decide what I wanted to say. I think um, that is a verb. It could be. Uh, and then when our recording is available, I post it on here as well. So if you're big on Facebook, like us over there, and you'll get notified of what's going on with the show a couple times a week. Other than that, that wraps up today. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thank you, all you guys, for joining me today and sharing about our books. Maybe in a year or so, we'll do another round and have other people. Like I said, we've got all That's the rest. That's a good idea. And, you know, yeah. despite of what it looks like here, we've got a lot of, of our male staff that are doing this as well. Mm -hmm. So they're out there as well. Maybe we'll get yeah, them Yeah, they can do the next show. Yes. Yeah, yeah do the guy's <laughs> books. Can you, you can use that to pressure them into being on the show. Yes, we. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. So thank you very much. I think I have one. Let's see if I have any questions here or comments. Okay, we're good to go. All right, thanks a lot. See you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.